Wells would offer his only son.
Good morning and uh, welcome to Seven Hills Anglican Church. My name's Abraham. It's great that you can meet us this morning. Uh, we're going to carry on our series in Genesis and um, yeah, we'll be looking at Genesis 19 a bit later on. Uh, let us uh, start our time together by singing this wonderful song, Holy is the Lord. Good morning, everyone. I'm John. I'm going to lead the singing this morning. Uh, <clears throat> I think holy might be the, the key word for the morning. So we're going to sing, Holy is the Lord. Would you like to stand and join me as we sing, Holy is the Lord? Stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He And together we sing Holy is the Lord God Almighty The earth is filled his glory. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory. We stand and lift up our hands, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. And together we sing. And everyone sing. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. is filled with his glory the earth is filled with his glory it's rising up all around it's the anthem of the Lord's renown it's rising up all around it's the anthem of the Lord's renown Together we sing, and everyone sing. Holy is the Lord God Almighty, the earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord God Almighty, the earth is filled with His glory. have a seat. Let us pray together by saying the words of the confession on the screen. Together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have gone our own way, not loving you as we ought, nor loving our neighbors as ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We deserve your condemnation. Father, forgive us. Help us to love you and our neighbors and to live for your honor and glory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Let us continue in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy in our lives. Thank you that through Christ we have peace with you, 
and even more, we are your children and can call you Father. Thank you for your love and care. Thank you that you hear our prayers and that you have given us your spirit to encourage and help us to walk with you each day. Thank you, Father, that we are here in Australia and are blessed with a good democratic process. Thank you that we have had peaceful and a fair election process. We pray that those in government will govern well and for the good of the whole community. We pray that they will remember those in our communities who are oppressed and without voice and that they will look to use their power and position to show love and justice to the vulnerable. We pray for parts of this world where there is political injustice and conflict, places where there is war and systematic violence. We pray for peace. In particular, Lord, we pray for the ongoing war in Ukraine. We pray that you will bring about a swift end to the violence. We especially remember our brothers and sisters in North Kenya who are experiencing tribal violence. Please bring an end to this and enable your gospel to spread. Please bless the work of Norman Janelle that it may bear enduring fruit. Lord, we also remember those in our community who are struggling with homelessness. We ask that in, in this time you will provide for them. Help them as they face the cold and challenging conditions. And we pray especially for organizations such as Anglicare that they would be able to show Christ's love for the homeless in practical ways. Help us support them in their efforts. We bring before you our brothers and sisters at, of this church. We pray for all those who are mourning. We bring before you the families and friends of Judy Pierce and Anya, Anya's mom, Jan. Help them as they grieve. Comfort them with your spirit and may they find peace in knowing Judy and Jan are with you and free from the sufferings of this fleeting life. We pray that the families will be able to also complete all the administrative tasks smoothly and that they can celebrate the lives and impact that these wonderful women had on their families and friends. Heavenly Father, we also pray for our dear brother Luke. Thank you for the fellowship we have enjoyed with him. We pray that as he moves to Port Macquarie, that you will help him with the transition. Help him, Father, to settle into a new church and make meaningful connections. Help him as he adjusts to working with new NDIS staff. We pray that you help him to adjust and enjoy this new stage of his life. Lord, we also pray for Norm, that you would thank you that his surgery went well. We pray that his recovery will be complete and quick. Strengthen him, Lord, for the work that you have planned for him here and in Kenya. We also pray for the young people who are going to publicly declare their faith at the confirmation service tonight. Thank you that you have worked through their lives to bring them to this point. Help us as a church to continue to support and enable them to grow in their faith as they look to live lives to glorify you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, good morning. Good to see you this morning. Uh, can I particularly welcome those who are visiting us or with us for the first time and perhaps watching for the first time online. Great that you're able to join in with us uh, as we meet together. Uh, in terms of things taking place, just a, a reminder about a few things. Uh, as we just prayed, uh, it's Luke's last Sunday with us. So he's been planning to head up to Port Macquarie for a while now. Um, so just uh, be praying, continue to pray for him as that goes well. Uh, we have got a morning tea just to kind of celebrate that and to uh, sort of give thanks to God for the, the blessing he's been to us over the time he's been with us. So I uh, hope you can hang around for morning tea afterwards. Thanks for those who have been able to bring that together. Uh, also, uh, just a reminder about Judy's funeral. We'll be here at church on uh, Wednesday afternoon starting at 1.30 if you want to come along to that. Uh, if you're coming along and you might be able to help out with the afternoon tea, um, Alwyn and uh, Annie Groskopf are uh, kind of overseeing, coordinating that. Uh, I believe there's a uh, sheet of paper on the back bench there. 
so if you're coming along and you bring something, just make a note of it on that so people can sort of see what's coming and uh, yeah, we can kind of uh, oversee that process. If you have any questions, um, you can get in contact with Olwyn or if you're not sure how to do that, uh, let me know and I can kind of put you in contact with her about that. Uh, also, um, we've got a video about five fish. We're going to watch that now. Five fish is 10 years old this year. <laughs> That's 10 years of updates, developments and hard work to provide one simple to use app that enables people to access and share the gospel in all the languages of the world. To celebrate this special milestone, Global Recordings Network has declared 2022 to be the year of Five Fish. We have developed and refined the app so now it's time to let you know so that you can download Five Fish onto your phone and be ready. So Christine, why should people use Five Fish? That's a great question, Jeff. So the Apostle Paul says in the book of Romans, chapter 10, that faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of Christ. Five Fish is a mobile phone app that allows you to tell the story of Jesus in over 6,700 different languages and speech varieties. It's an essential cross-cultural evangelism tool that's great when you're having a conversation and you hit a language barrier. It's really easy to use, it fits into your pocket, and it comes to you free of charge. You can download FiveFish from the Apple App Store or Google Play. And why not get involved this year? Head on to our website and learn how you can be a part of the Year of Five Fish. Five Fish is... Hi friends. To help celebrate the 10th birthday of the Five Fish app, Jaren is hosting a dinner at Lily's Function Centre in Seven Hills. Please join me as we reflect on what God has done through this app and look forward to what he might do in the future. Our guest speaker will be Kevin Murray from the Australian Presbyterian World Mission. Everyone is invited. I look forward to seeing you there on July the 16th. It should be a fun night. God bless. Uh, if you want more information or you want to sort of book for that in, that's a, that QR code there will take you uh, to that. I will also email that out for uh, our regular members too, so you've got those details and the links to get there. Uh, across the term, the uh, children have been heading out to Kids Church. Uh, before they do that today, I think we're going to share something with us. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, this term the kids have been looking at Exodus. And as part of that, they've been doing a fun memory verse to help them remember what the main idea of uh, their studies have been. So I'm going to invite Nancy and Tim up the front and some of the kids from the group, and they're going to share with you something they've been learning. Jesus is the saviour, the saviour of the world. We're going to just say one more time, nice and loud. Uh, it's John chapter 4, verse 42. Okay, one, two, three, go. Jesus is the saviour, the saviour of the world. Jesus is the saviour, the saviour of the world. Jesus is the saviour, the saviour of the world. Chapter 4, verse 42. John chapter 4, verse 42. 
John chapter 4, verse 42. I was never very good at clapping. It's just not quite coordinated enough. Uh, uh, before they head out, just a reminder of that confirmation service this evening. Uh, so we've got about nine uh, members of our church who will be sort of taking that stand and uh, declaring their faith. Uh, Bishop Gary Koo will be along for that. Uh, so please be praying for them. And, uh, you know, as I say, if, if you uh, want to come along tomorrow, tonight, uh, you are allowed to come to church twice on a Sunday. Uh, it would be great to have you with us uh, as part of that. Um, uh, I think the, before the children head out, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, I'm just going to pray for the kids heading out to kids' church. So uh, join me. Uh, loving Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. Uh, we pray, Father, for um, the children as they uh, head out, that you would give them uh, wisdom and understanding as they uh, engage with your word, that they would grow in their uh, maturity. Um, thank you for the teachers and the time they put in preparing. We pray, Lord, you'd have a work through them so they might uh, clearly teach your word. And Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' great name. Amen. The children like to head out? We're going to have our Bible readings for this morning and we're going to start with uh, Genesis chapter 19. Bear with me, it is not an easy passage to read. Genesis chapter 19. The two angels entered Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in Sodom's gateway. When Lot saw them, he got up to meet them. He bowed with his face to the ground and said, my lords, turn aside to your servant's house, wash your feet and spend the night, then you can get up early and go on your way. No, they said, we would rather spend the night in the square. But he urged them so strongly that they followed him and went into his house. He prepared a feast and baked unleavened bread for them, and they ate. Before they went to bed, the men of the city of Sodom, both young and old, the whole population surrounded the house. They called out to Lot and said, Where are the men that came to you tonight? Send them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Lot went out to them at the entrance and shut the door behind him. He said, Don't do this evil, my brothers. Look, I've got two daughters who haven't been intimate with a man. I'll bring them out to you and you can do whatever you want to them. However, don't do anything to these men because they have come under the protection of my roof. Get out of the way, they said, adding, this one came here as an alien, but he's acting like a judge. Now we'll do more harm to you than to them. They put pressure on Lot and came up to break down the door. But the angels reached out, brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. They struck the men who were at the entrance of the house, both young and old, with blindness, so that they were unable to find the entrance. Then the angels said to Lot, do you have anyone else here? a son-in-law, your sons and daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of this place, for we are about to destroy this place, because the outcry against its people is so great before the Lord, that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who were going to marry his daughters. Get up, he said, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. At daybreak, the angels urged Lot on, Get up, 
Take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he hesitated. Because of the Lord's compassion for him, <coughs> Sorry, the men grabbed his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters. They brought him out and left him outside the city. As soon as the angels got them outside, one of them said, Run for your lives, don't look back, and don't stop anywhere on the plain. Run to the mountains, or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, No, my lords, please. Your servant has indeed found favour with you, and you have shown me great kindness by saving my life. But I can't run to the mountains. The disaster will overtake me, and I will die. Look, this town is close enough for me to flee to. It's a small place. Please, let me run to it. It's only a small place, isn't it? So that I can survive. And he said to them, see, and he said to him, All right, I'll grant your request about this matter too and will not demolish the town you mentioned. Hurry up, run to it, for I cannot do anything until you are there. Therefore, the name of the city is Zor. The sun had risen over the land when Lot reached Zor. Then out of the sky, the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, burning sulphur from the Lord. He demolished these cities, the entire plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, the entire plain, sorry, all the inhabitants of the cities and whatever grew on the ground. But Lot's wife looked back and became a pillar of salt. Early in the morning, Abraham went to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked down towards Sodom and Gomorrah and all the land of the plain. And he saw that smoke was going up from the land like smoke of a furnace. So it was when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham and brought Lot out of the middle of the upheaval when he demolished the cities where Lot had lived. Lot departed from Zor and lived in the mountains along with his two daughters because he was afraid to live in Zor. Instead, he and his two daughters lived in a cave. Then the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old and there is no man in this land to sleep with us, as is the custom of all the land. Come, let's get our father to drink wine so that we can sleep with him and preserve our father's line. So they got their father to drink wine that night. And the firstborn came and slept with her father. He did not know when she lay down or when she got up. The next day, the firstborn said to the younger, Look, I slept with my father last night. Let's get him to drink wine again tonight so that you can go to sleep with him and we can preserve our father's line. That night, they again got their father to drink wine and the younger went and slept with him. He did not know when she lay down or when she got up. So both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their father. The firstborn gave birth to a son and named him Moab. He is the father of the Moabites of today. The younger also gave birth to a son and she named him Ben-Ami. He is the father of the Ammonites of today. The New Testament reading is from the book of 2 Peter. And we're reading from verses 4 to verse 9. From verse 4, for if God didn't spare the angels who sinned, but cast them into hell and delivered them in chains of utter darkness to be kept for judgment, and if he didn't spare the ancient world but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, when he brought the flood on the world of the ungodly, and if he reduced the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes and condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is coming on the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, distressed by the depraved behaviour of the immoral, for, that, sorry, for as that righteous man lived among them day by day, his righteous soul was tormented by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Thanks, Ian. Uh, Ian drew the short straw having to read that one, didn't he? Uh, friends, as we uh, come to reflect on that passage from uh, Genesis 19, it would be helpful for you to have a Bible with you, so you can be looking at that passage for yourself. It is a, uh, a long section, so it's good that you can kind of cast your eyes over that as we uh, work our way through it and reflect on that. 
um, I think someone said it's on page 14, if you've got the church Bibles there. Uh, there's also a bit of an outline on the back there. And when, if you're watching online, you can kind of uh, follow that QR code to access the uh, online version of uh, that back, um, outline. Friends, uh, let's pray. Uh, loving Father, we thank you that uh, your word is living and active and it equips us with everything we need for a life of trusting in Jesus and uh, following him and uh, bearing good fruit in our lives. So we pray, Father, that your word would achieve its purposes in our hearts this morning as we engage with your word. We pray these things in Jesus' great name. Amen. Uh, we spend a lot of money and time and uh, sort of thought. We invest a lot in our legal system. Uh, it's because we want to, uh, to ensure that uh, we do the best job we can of uh, making sure that the uh, innocent and the guilty are distinguished uh, and so that the guilty are punished and the innocent aren't punished. They kind of go free, if you like. Um, now, it's, it's, it's a difficult process and uh, no system is completely accurate. So I wonder, if you had to make a choice, now this is sort of idealistic, of course, but if you had to choose between two systems, if you could have a system that uh, made sure that every guilty person was caught and punished, but uh, some innocent people were caught up in that process and falsely kind of found guilty and punished, would you prefer that option? Or would you prefer an option where no innocent people were caught up, they were, all innocent people uh, were sort of made sure that they were kind of freed, but that that meant some guilty people got away with it? They weren't sort of uh, uh, found guilty and punished. Which of those would you prefer? Which system would you go with? Uh, this is one of the things that uh, legal minds turn their sort of uh, spend time kind of writing about and thinking about. Uh, you know, what's where should the burden of emphasis be in a kind of legal system? And there's perhaps something of this question uh, hanging over Genesis 19. Because, uh, but not to do with any kind of human legal system, more kind of the question of God. Uh, how do we understand the justice of God? Uh, you may recall in uh, chapter 18, Abraham had had this, uh, you know, with the angel that had visited him, with his, had this discussion with God about God's justice. God had revealed his plans to judge the wickedness of Sodom. Um, I take it Abraham knows that that's where his nephew Lot's gone. And so he starts this discussion with God about, well, what, what about if there are innocent bystanders in this? What if in the city of Sodom you find you know, 50 righteous people? Will you destroy those 50 righteous people with the city? You know, is, is, is God's justice a blunt instrument? Uh, and you know, God says, no, not for 50. And then sort of that, that kind of almost like that uh, negotiating in the marketplace. What about for 45, 45, 45? No, no. What about 40? What about 30? What about 20? What about, you know, ends with, what about 10? If you, if you found only 10 righteous people in the whole city, would you kind of be, allow them to kind of be swept away uh, in your judgment? And God says, no, no, for, for 10 righteous people, I will preserve, this, you know, hold off the judgment of the city. And, and that's kind of where the conversation just suddenly stops. Uh, as Abraham and the angel of the Lord go their separate ways. And so that question is actually hanging over our, our minds as we come to chapter 19. You may recall Josh said, said this is chapter 18, chapter 19. It's the same day uh, those three angels had turned up on, um, uh, sort of turned up for lunch, if you like, with Abraham. Uh, and then uh, Abraham had been chatting with one of them while the two others headed off. Well, here they are, the uh, beginning of chapter 19. Uh, the two angels uh, have, uh, that have left Abraham have now turned up in the city gates of Sodom. It's evening time. Uh, and so we, we have this question, will, will they find ten righteous people? Uh, will they be able to find anyone righteous? Uh, in this city? How will we see God's justice carried out uh, over this, uh, in this time, over this city? We know it's a city of great wickedness. It's kind of been uh, mentioned to us a number of times. Uh, and so there's a sense in which these angels are here on a fact-finding mission, if you like, to sort of see what's going on for themselves, perhaps, or uh, to assess it. And, you know, certainly for us, 
it enables us to sort of get a behind the kind of curtain look at how God is going about executing justice. And we, we see that uh, we meet straight away a lot. Lot is at the city gate. And one of the things we need to kind of be aware of is there's a kind of uh, uncertainty as we go through this chapter. Uh, there's a question, how do we assess Lot? Is Lot righteous? Is he deserving of being saved? Or has he, uh, if you like, fallen in with the, 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 the people and the culture of Sodom? Has he been caught up? Has he been corrupted in the sinfulness of Sodom? Uh, the scriptures remind us, uh, sort of warn us in, in a number of places uh, that bad company corrupts good morals. Has, is this what maybe has happened to Lot? as he's taken up residence. You may recall that originally uh, both he and Abraham were nomadic, uh, travelling around uh, in tents with their sort of vast herds and things like this. Uh, Lot no longer is under tent. He's actually taken up permanent residence. He's moved into the city and living in the city, uh, a city of great wickedness. Has he been corrupted? That's the kind of what we're kind of trying to assess as the story unfolds, as we see this interaction between uh, the two visitors... And Lot. And the first indication is perhaps quite positive because Lot's actions mirror what we saw Abraham do. You remember in chapter 18, the three guests uh, turned up, the three visitors, and Abraham bowed down and sort of washed, you know, let me wash your feet, let me put on a feast for you. And so they had lunch together. And so at first glance, it looks like Lot is, if you like, uh, the carbon copy of Abraham. He, he, he bows down. He says, uh, Lord, my lords, turn aside to your servant's house. Wash your feet. Spend the night. He's, he's offering them hospitality. That's a good thing, right? Yes, but there's just a bit of ambiguity here. It's partly because um, in Hebrew, there's a Hebrew um, euphemism. Uh, feet are a euphemism for genitals. Uh, and so sometimes uh, the word feet is used and it's kind of a sort of euphemistic kind of way in that culture of referring to, to genitals. And so uh, is Lot, what's Lot offering here when he says he's willing to you know, wash their feet? Now, Abraham did this back in chapter 18, but it was very clear there because straight away he pulls out a bucket of water. Oh, right, he's, he's to to, he really, really wants to wash their feet, quite literally. Uh, and of course, what did the angels do? They accepted Abraham's invitation. We're left with some ambiguity here. What's, what's Lot offering? Because there's no specific immediate mention of water. And do you notice the, uh, the, the visitor's response? No, they said. Uh, here we are in verse uh, 2. Uh, we would rather spend the night in the square. For some reason, they're not keen to take up Lot's offer of hospitality. Is it because perhaps they're uh, kind of concerned about what exactly Lot is offering? We're kind of, we don't know. Uh, we're left kind of uh, waiting to see. We need more information to, to assess exactly what's going on here. Uh, verse 3, Lot kind of urges them so strongly that they, you almost get a sense they're almost like forced to kind of take up his offer as hospitality. Uh, he invites them back. And uh, we kind of breathe a bit of a sigh of relief because uh, what's on offer is a feast. Oh, that's like what Abraham did. A feast of baked unleavened bread for them and they ate. Uh, then before they went to bed, um, however, the men of the city of Sodom, both young and old, the whole population, just to see it's repeated uh, three ways here, uh, is anyone left out? No, no, this is the whole town has turned out. Will the visitors find 10 righteous people in the city? Well, we're about to find out because what's going to happen is the whole town, it certainly is at least represented by the actions of the crowd, if not the whole crowd is the whole city, they, they've come out. And so however, however they behave will give us an insight into the righteousness of the city. And it's not good. Whereas Lot and Abraham, if you like, their, uh, the fruit of their righteousness was their expression of hospitality. You see the righteousness of the way they treat the kind of the guests. Then uh, Sodom is not just a lack of hospitality. It's the exact opposite of a lack of hospitality. It's hostility to the guest. 
a desire to exploit uh, the vulnerable guests. Where are the men, they say in verse 5, where are the men who came to you tonight? Send them out so that we can have sex with them. Um, one of the other sort of things that's happening in this passage is there's a play on the word to know. Um, some of you who perhaps have read other English translations of the Bible know that often uh, the Bible will talk about um, you know, uh, knowing as a, as a euphemism for having sex. And so a, a husband will know his wife, uh, you know, uh, Adam knew uh, Eve, and it's got this uh, euphemism there. Uh, and so uh, the, uh, the crowd come and they say, we want to know the men. And so what do they want to know? Uh, are they, do, they, do they want to know... What, uh, just to find out about them? Uh, or is it the, you know, the, the passage here is translated to make it more explicit because it becomes apparent that that's actually what they want. They want to abuse these visitors uh, as, evil, as Lot's response. But they're kind of an interesting play here because they, uh, once again, this idea of playing on the word knowing and it's two meanings, to know someone and to sort of have sex, uh, is sort of played out in the chapter. And so the crowd, they want to abuse these visitors, they want to know them, but they don't know them uh, because these visitors are actually angels of the Lord. And one suspects if they knew that they were angels of the Lord, they wouldn't be so uh, keen to abuse them and uh, seek to exploit them. Uh, that's certainly kind of an expression of how sinful they are. Uh, Lot goes out and he uh, seeks to um, protect them. He, he steps out, he closes the door behind him and, uh, you know, look, my brothers, do not do this evil thing. So, uh, you know, a, a, a Lot has stepped out here and he's seeking to defend his guests. He's, he's being the good host, isn't he? That, that's a good thing, isn't it? That's, that's a righteous thing to be wanting to step out and uh, protect uh, the visitors to make sure that they're not harmed. And he seeks to kind of talk the crowd down uh, and get them to uh, turn aside from their course of action. Uh, verse 8, look, I've got two daughters who haven't been intimate with a man. I'll bring them out to you and you can do whatever you want to them. Wait a second. Is that what a righteous man would really offer? Uh, you know, in one sense, you kind of go, well, it's, he's trying to be hospitable to his guests, but really? Uh, can I say that the, uh, this is an abominable thing to offer? It's an atrocious thing. And the, the, the scriptures would recognize this. The readers, original readers would rightly recognize this is an atrocious offer to make. However good intention he might be to protect his, his, his guests, his visitors, you wouldn't go to this extent. In fact, you have sort of uh, vague parallels of, of things like this happening in other places in the scripture. And in every other place, it is very clearly a, a picture of absolute depravity for this sort of thing to be offered or to happen. So what are we to make of Lot? That he makes such an extraordinary offer. What, what sort of level of depravity has he sunk to that he would think that this is a good offer to make? Before anything, uh, well, what does happen is his, his attempts to protect his visitors uh, blow up in his face. Uh, as we see there that um, they turn around and uh, not only do they kind of turn back, uh, sort of say, we will have none of that, um, get out of the way. Uh, they go on and add to that. Uh, this one came here as an alien. They're talking about the Lot. So Lot was new to the city, if you like. But he's acting like a judge. Now we'll do more harm to you than to them. Uh, Lot's efforts to try and stop the evil actions have actually blown up in his face and now he's the target facing uh, more evil based on himself than even his guests. Uh, which is to my pausing and just reflecting on this, this is a pattern we will kind of see again and again that standing up for what's right and good uh, will often invite opposition. In, in a world where there is sin and evil at work, then standing up for what's right and good will often mean that you face hardship. Uh, you know, Jesus uh, said to us, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. If you're going to be part of uh, the kingdom of heaven, you're going to stand up for righteousness, uh, you'll get persecuted for it. Uh, Paul like, makes sort of repeats that same idea. Uh, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 
when you stand up for doing what's right and good, sometimes you stand up as a follower of Jesus and people will oppose you because they don't like Jesus and so they oppose you for being a follower of Jesus. Sometimes it may actually not necessarily have to do with the fact that you're following Jesus, but simply because you want to stand up for what's right and good. Uh, because you're a follower of Jesus, you, you don't want to lie, you don't want to uh, be involved with uh, activities you see as sinful or wrong or uh, unloving or whatever it might be. And instead of just being told, well, if you don't want to join us, that's fine, um, sometimes you actually get people getting angry with you for not joining in the evil. I was told, uh, uh, minister told me about it, someone in their church who um, uh, was a man who was kind of quite high up in a business and uh, there was a company that had did uh, trade internationally and um, uh, in, in an effort to secure an international contract, uh, his, his manager, his boss, uh, told him to offer a bribe to see if they could seal the contract. Uh, and this, this guy's a you know, follower of Jesus and he sort of said, well, that, that's, that's wrong. <laughs> I can't do that. Uh, I would prefer not to be part of this project uh, if that is what is involved. Uh, and he found himself fired. Uh, not because he you know, didn't offer a bribe, they came up with some other way of kind of uh, working it out, but it was because he refused to take part in the wrong action, he found himself out of a job. And that was a serious, he's a guy who married, young kids. Uh, because of the way that they had orchestrated his release, he found it very difficult to find another job. He hadn't done anything wrong. In fact, what he'd done was he'd refused to do something that was evil. But by standing up for what is good, he faced opposition and hardship. And Jesus warns us, as we seek to follow Jesus, as we pursue righteousness, as we pursue a life the way God calls us to live, don't be surprised if it comes with a cost. Certainly times that there are sacrifices we have to make, sometimes it actually invites people kind of, you know, that sense of, Oh, because you're not joining us in getting drunk or whatever it might be, then you're judging us and you can find yourself excluded. You can find yourself facing consequences. And I suspect as uh, we, we're part of a society that uh, more and more kind of wants to divide, sort of determine its own understanding of right and wrong, uh, more often than not, as followers of Jesus, we're going to find ourselves on the outside of what those around us think is an appropriate way of behaving or living. And uh, so life, uh, like Lot, we might find ourselves in the crosshairs. Don't be surprised, uh, but we are called to persevere. Uh, Lot was, uh, you know, just as when things looked like they'd gone really bad for Lot, uh, that's when the, uh, the two guests step in. It's not like the guests ever really needed protecting. They are angels of the Lord. As angels of the Lord, they carry the authority of God and they exercise the power of God. They step in, they uh, pull Lot back into the house. The uh, crowd are struck blind and one suspects stunned uh, so that they can't find the front door. I don't know how uh, you know, it takes a, a, for the whole city to come out and not be able to find a house. That's pretty blind. Uh, that's sort of some uh, sort of stunning that uh, these angels have done on this crowd to hold them back from, you know, to contain their evil. Uh, the, uh, the angels, uh, you sort of think in light of what uh, Lot has offered with regards to his daughters, the angels still seem keen to help him out uh, and so they uh, warn him that the judgment coming. So it's now abundantly clear there are not ten righteous people in, in, uh, in Sodom. And so judgment is coming. And so the angels warn Lot and his family, and if you know anyone is connected with you in the city, go and get them now. It is time to flee, to turn away, to leave behind the sinfulness and to flee because judgment is coming. Uh, that is the righteous action in the, case of in, the, in the face of judgment on its way. Uh, so if you have any sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone else in the city, uh, go and get them now. And so we're told, verse 14, Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law. Uh, this is curious, isn't it? Uh, we were told that uh, Lot said, I've got two daughters, 
who've never known a man, but now I've just got to go out and grab and speak to my sons-in-law. What's a son-in-law? Someone who's married to your daughter. And if they're married, presumably they've known their husband and so what's going on here? In fact, it, it, just in case we forget it, actually, in the passage, it actually repeats it. Unfortunately, I think sometimes the translators have not sure what's going on here, and so they've, they've said uh, who were going to marry his daughters. It's actually very clear that uh, his sons-in-law, who had married his daughters, is what it actually says. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a, it's a detail that's being revealed at this point that causes us to go back and rethink the whole film. It's like the... You know those movies where you get to the end and there's some sudden twist. Uh, I'm trying to think of one without spoiling a movie for you, but I couldn't think of any. But you know the ones I'm talking about. Uh, the, uh, was it was it Sixth Sense? Yeah. When he no okay. Uh, you know the, you, you get the, 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 the there's a reveal and something. Go wait a second. I have to go back and watch the whole movie again with this piece of information. This is what's happening here. And so the, the sons-in-laws who had married, it's kind of emphasising in case you miss it, and the, the kind of they, there's a whole conversation with the sons-in-laws in case you don't catch on. Wait a second, what was he talking about with the, his daughters he was offering? Presumably they weren't even in the house. The, what seems to have been the case is Lot, in an attempt to defend his guests, He's kind of coming up with some ruse, some trick. He's trying to delay the crowd from pressing in. Maybe he was hoping to buy a bit of time so that they could escape through the back door. I don't know. But it's clear that he didn't have two daughters who'd never known a man who were in the house that he could offer the crowd. Because his two daughters are off in another part of the city with their husbands. And Lot has to go and get them afterwards. When the angels say it's time to get out of this place, uh, verse 15, get up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, uh, who are here now, because they weren't here before, is what the passage is saying. Now is the time to flee uh, because judgment is on the way. You see, now we actually kind of go, wait a second. So Lot is righteous. He is someone who hasn't been completely corrupted by, oh, whew. But then we're told he hesitates. <laughs> Judgment's coming. Oh, really? You know, got a nice house here, just painted the walls. Why, why is he hesitating? There's some small part of him that still kind of loves the place he's, he's chosen to make home. But we see the grace of God at work. But because of the Lord's compassion for him, Quite literally, the men grab his hands, grab his wife's hands, grab his daughter's hands and like drag them through the streets to the city gate and almost sort of shove them out the front of the city gate and say, go! Get out of here. Leave this behind. Run for the hills. And Lot says, yeah, the hills are a long way away. Do you think we could kind of, you know... So he picks uh, a small town, like a, the, the word Zor means small. Uh, this small city, it's just tiny, it's small. It's insane. Maybe if we get to there, uh, what this means is that Zor, one assumes, uh, was originally planned to be caught up in the judgment, uh, but now is spared because Lot wants to pause there. And so that's the plan. They run to Zor. The judgment of God comes. Sodom and Gomorrah are completely destroyed. Uh, and we're told uh, they make it to Zor, but uh, Lot's wife, we're to uh, verse 26, but Lot's wife looked back and became a pillar of salt. I, I take it this isn't like one of those sort of uh, Medusa, you know, you look at the so Medusa's face, you turn to stone. I don't think it's, it's kind of like she accidentally looked in the revision mirror and was sort of caught out, you know, oh dear. Uh, this sense of looking back is it's not just kind of the gaze, it's, if you like, it's where her heart is. She's looking back to Sodom because that's what she identifies with. That's where she wants to be. It's a bit like when uh, in the Exodus, when uh, the Israelites, you know, having been saved out of slavery in Egypt and 
get to the edge of the promised land and they say, you know what, we want to go back to Egypt. They had onions and garlic. We love onions. Fantastic. Can we go back to Egypt, please? We don't want to go to the promised land. We don't want salvation. We want the good life of slavery. And that seems to be the implication of what uh, Lot's wife uh, had chosen. And so she comes under the judgment of that. And so it was, we're told, God destroyed the city. He remembered Abraham and brought Lot out of the middle of a people. So it's actually God's actions are tied with his covenant, his commitment to Abraham. Lot is saved because of the grace of God he experiences through God's uh, a covenant with, with Abraham. Uh, and then we get this really unsavory end to the chapter, don't we? Uh, Lot kind of doesn't stay in Zor. He's fearful, we're told. Perhaps he's fearful of being persecuted um, you know, the same way they threatened him back in Sodom. And so he heads up to, we're told, the mountain caves. I don't know why he doesn't go to Abraham. Maybe he's, I don't know, uh, ashamed or who knows. Uh, but instead he kind of takes the, the task of sort of living as a hermit's life with his two daughters in the cave. Uh, now, one of the things that happens here is, is there's a, a bit of a, once again, play on the language of knowing. Uh, the, um, but really what's, what's here is, is, is this sad kind of contrast with God's work with Abraham and Sarah because God provides children. And here we have Lot's daughters concerned for having descendants, for having children. But instead of depending on God and trusting in God to provide in his own time and therefore uh, choosing righteousness and pursuing righteousness and allowing God to provide, uh, the, if you like, the, the daughters of Lot take matters into their own hands. They're, they're trying to control their own future. They're not depending on God. They don't trust God at all to provide in any way. They sort of, all they see is despair. And so they choose unrighteousness as a way of trying to preserve their future. And of course, there's a bit of a play on this language of knowing because uh, uh, Lot knows his daughters, but he doesn't know he's known his daughters uh, because they get him drunk. And so what it means is that even though Sodom and Gomorrah and the plain has been uh, judged and wiped out, something of Sodom has been preserved the culture of Sodom lives on, if you like. And uh, there's a sense in which these, that these, the descendants of these two become significant nations that surround Israel later in its history. The Moabites and the Ammonites conceived, if you like, in the sinfulness of Sodom, in the unrighteousness of Sodom. What are we to make of this chapter? What do we do with it? It's a long chapter. Why is the, I mean, the author could have really kind of skipped over this in a short paragraph, but instead it sort of gives us the whole detail, the long chapter. It's not like Lot becomes a significant figure. This is the last time we see Lot. He, does, he disappears from the text. The next time really Lot pops up is that passage from you know, 2 Peter we had. Uh, so why spend so much time? I think part of it is, is it's a reminder of, uh, you know, as we kind of follow Abraham through and what's happening to Abraham and how God's keeping his promise to Abraham, it's a reminder of, of human sinfulness. As God calls Abraham to be, if you like, to walk with the Lord, to be righteous, it's a reminder of the, where the human heart is. Uh, we are sinful. Uh, passages like these, you know, we, we like to think that we're... Um, uh, we're not that bad, and you know, particularly because we're in our own culture, and we sort of, our own culture has its ideas of what's right and good, and so we kind of assess ourselves by them. And we think, well, yeah, we're we're kind of quite nice. Uh, no one's perfect, but not really, really bad. Uh, passages like these remind us that the human heart is actually quite sinful. That uh, humanity disconnected from God is unrighteous. Where it heads is is Sodom and Gomorrah. That's the potential in each ones of our, our, each of our hearts. We're not supposed to look at this and go, weren't the Sodomite, weren't the Gomorrah, weren't they terrible? No, this is a mirror on ourselves, on our sinfulness. 
And it's a reminder then also of the fact that God is a God who is just and holy and who will judge sin. And he's able to do so accurately and uh, with great justice. And it reminds us here in the middle of uh, Abraham's sort of life of what's at stake here. When God says to Abraham, through your descendants, I will bless the nations. We, we kind of once again reminded of the weight of that blessing that is to come. God's not saying, look, there's going to be a bit of ice cream after dinner. That's, that's a blessing. That's nice. Fantastic. A little icing on the cake. No, this is the whole thing. It's, it's, it's serious. This is, this is weighty. Huma Where is humanity he heading? It's heading towards judgment. Where is the world heading? It's wearing, heading towards the fate that sort of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah came to because of their sinfulness. Unless there is a blessing from God. This is where we're heading. And so it's therefore also an encouragement for us as we trust God to persevere in trusting in God. Particularly when things get difficult. When things are hard, when it doesn't look like life is working out the way we expected or when we find a face sort of opposition, and it's easy to think, well, I'll just compromise my principles. I'll you know, choose the easy way out, the, 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 the thing that looks exciting, the interesting. No. See here the, the weightiness of sin, the seriousness of sin. And so don't, you know, don't let sin go unchecked in your life. What's the right response to seeing the sinfulness and its consequences? It's to examine our own hearts and repent. To assess our culture, to assess our own lives. Are there areas of our lives that really are at odds with what it is to be a follower of Jesus? Are we allowing sin to go un unchecked in our hearts? Are we allowing to to gain root and grow and uh, flourish in parts of our lives. Friends, if we're doing that, then heed the warning. Sin is not something that is light. It is serious and the consequences are serious. And so we should flee from sin. Leave it behind. Don't look back. Don't long for it. Put it to death in our hearts. I think also for us as followers of Jesus, as we look back at Genesis through, uh, you know, through Jesus, I think one of the other things it does is that this chapter reminds us of the extraordinary grace of God. Can you imagine if the story had unfolded? The, the two angels come to, uh, to Sodom. And what they do is they chase the entire population of Sodom out of the gates. Flee, flee to the hills. This, this city is about to be destroyed. And so all the unrighteous sinners of Sodom flee to the mountains, but Lot is kept in the city. And Lot is caught up in the judgment. What an extraordinary thing that would be. But that is the grace of God he shows to us in the work of Christ, isn't it? Uh, Christ, the... Uh, yeah, no, wait a second. Behind myself, there we are. Christ suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous. To bring us to God. Uh, so it reminds us of the great grace that he's shown for us we who do not deserve mercy have been shown mercy the judgment that we deserve has fallen on christ seize hold of that grace friends to god be the glory let's pray loving father we thank you for your uh, that you are god who is holy and just that you see the evil of this world the sin of this world we thank you that you are going to deal with this world and all the injustices that you have set aside a day of judgment uh, where all sin will be brought to account. But we also thank you for your great grace you show to us in Jesus who comes to us 
warning us of the judgment to come, who takes upon us the judgment we deserve so we can experience salvation and full life. We pray, Lord, help us to seize hold of that grace. Help us to leave behind sin. We pray your spirit would give us strength and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Sobering. <clears throat> We're going to sing again. If you'd like to stand and join me as we sing, Only a Holy God. Who else commands all the hosts of heaven? Who else could make every king bow down? Who else can whisper and darkness tremble? Only a holy God. What other beauty demands such praises? What other splendor outshines the sun? What other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy, forever a holy God. Come and worship the holy Water the glory consumes like fire. Water the power can raise the dead. Water the name remains undefeated. Only a holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only. Worship the Holy God. Come and behold Him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy, forever a holy God. Come and worship the Holy God. Who else could rescue me from my failing who else would offer his only son who else invites me to call him father only a holy god only my holy god come and behold him the one the only cry out sing holy forever a holy god come and worship the holy god come and behold him the one and the only cry out sing holy forever a holy god Come and worship the Holy God. Come and worship the Holy God. Please take a seat. Friends, having uh, been reminded of the, uh, the justice of God and his extraordinary grace, uh, we're going to uh, celebrate that in the Lord's Supper.
which is a, it's a physical way of uh, symbolizing our faith in Jesus, in his death uh, on the cross for us, so that our sins can be dealt with and our need to trust in him for that. Uh, so uh, uh, what's going to happen is um, in a few moments we're going to hand that out. But before we do that, let's pray. Uh, loving Father, we do not come to your table trusting in our own righteousness, but in your boundless goodness and mercy. We are not even worthy to eat the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, always rich in mercy. Enable us to eat by faith the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may be cleansed from sin and forever dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Friends, uh, we're gonna have a few people are going to come and uh, pass the bread and the wine around. Uh, if you're watching online, you're welcome to uh, grab something to uh, eat and drink with us. Um, if you can't, that's fine. Uh, I can say because the in the end, the, the bread, Lord's Supper is a symbol of our faith, and it's actually our faith that's significant and important as we do this. Uh, so anyone who's with us, if you trust in Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, please join with us as we remind ourselves of that great grace for us. Uh, if for any reason you don't feel comfortable, feel free just to, to pass the bread and the wine along as it comes around. Uh, for those for whom it's significant, the, the bread's gluten-free and uh, there is uh, alcoholic and non-alcoholic wine on each of the trays. Friends, Christ suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. So take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Amen. Friends, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ keeps us in eternal life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful.
Let's pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, in your loving kindness, accept our thanks and praise. Grant that by the merits and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and your whole church may receive forgiveness of our sins and all other benefits of his death and resurrection. With gratitude for all your mercies, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to have our final song. I think this is a great song to finish the day. We belong to the day. We belong to the day, to the day that is to come when the night falls away and our Saviour will return. For the glory of the kings is in our hearts. On that day, we will be seen for what we are. Would you like to stand? And let's uh, sing this final song together. Thanks. <laughs> We belong to the day, to the day that is to come When the night falls away and our Saviour will return For the glory of the King is in our hearts On that day we will be seen for what we are We belong to the day let us journey in the light Put on faith, put on love As our armor for the fight And the promise of salvation in our eyes On that day the proud will fall The faithful rise Strong as a mighty rock A refuge in the coming wrath the heart of the bride belongs to Jesus, Jesus. The earth in its turning stops to marvel at the Son of God. And all of that day belongs to Jesus, Jesus. We belong to the day we were bought with Jesus. Jesus blood soon he comes as the judge in the power of his word we must tell of his salvation while we wait for the day when Jesus comes will be too late strong as a mighty rock a refuge in the coming wrath the heart of the bride belongs to Jesus, Jesus. The earth in its turning stops to marvel at the Son of God. And all of that day belongs to Jesus, Jesus. Ten thousand years go by, we will wait. Let us tell of his great love, he will come. For his patience means salvation. Strong as a mighty rock, a refuge in the coming rock. The heart of the bride belongs to Jesus, Jesus. The earth in its turning stops to marvel at the Son of God. And all of that day belongs to Jesus, Jesus. The earth in its turning stops to marvel at the Son of God. And all of that day belongs to Jesus, Jesus Thanks. Have a seat, please.
what a great um, talk on a very complex passage. Um, we were reminded to reflect on our hearts and deal with the sin there and also to seize hold of God's grace in Christ. Um, let me close our time together by praying this. May our God make us worthy of his calling and may he fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, just a reminder, we please do join us for morning tea and uh, make sure you say hi or bye to Luke.